If you love liberty, declare your independence by signing the Shire Society Declaration at shiresociety.com. Uh, so Lily Tang Williams, who was born in China just before China's Cultural Revolution, uh, which was considered the Wild West of China and might still be, uh, she was raised with her two brothers by illiterate working class parents. She grew up under Mao's regime, enduring poor living conditions, food rationing, communist indoctrination, and political and social chaos. In the tumultuous, tumultuous environment, she quickly developed street smarts and compassion, as well as the values of perseverance and hard work. She received a law degree at Fudan University in Shanghai and was a faculty member of the law school for three years while also practicing corporate law in Shanghai. She's been in the United States for 30 years now, uh, coming here to get a master's degree at the University of Texas in Austin. She was the Libertarian Party of Colorado's uh, candidate for uh, state rep in 2014. She's a former chair of Libertarian Party of Colorado. She was also a Senate candidate in 2016, uh, being the first candidate in how long to wind up actually being in debates, Lily? Uh, decades? Years. First time in 20 years. First time in 20 years a Libertarian was included in debate in Colorado. She is currently an advisory board member to USPIE, which is the U.S. Parents Involved in Education, and she's been married to her husband for 27 years, and they have three children. Please welcome Lily Tang Williams. I cannot stand behind here. All you see is my head. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm I like I like to see people. And, and one more reminder: uh, there is going to be the LNC vice chair debate. We have a box of questions that needs your questions. Uh, there are pieces of paper. Write them, and they will go in the box of questions. Thank you, Daryl, for your for the, for the introduction. That is make me sound a lot better than. And it really is. <laughs> so, and thank you sponsors for making this possible to, for me to come here. I love New Hampshire. Whenever I come here, I feel like this, this is a home. Home is uh, where freedom is, right? How many of you, have you been to China here? Wow, three, yeah. Anybody can speak a word of uh, Mandarin Chinese? Ni hao. <laughs> well, like my husband, who's from Texas, he said uh, he's good when he goes to China, as long as he can say, um, bathroom, beer, pijo, <laughs> and then that's good. <laughs> yeah. So as Daryl said, I was born two years before the Mao's Great Cultural Revolution. And uh, my parents were classified as a red class because they were the bottom of the food chain, blue collar workers, and no education. My dad is basically uh, illiterate. Uh, my mom only had an elementary school education. But my dad's very smart man. His dad actually was a country, like a, he's a villager person who can write court papers, but he was landowner got some um, mysterious disease. So my grandfather I never met, he died. Well, my father was only like a, a year old. My father has uh, five other siblings, and uh, then later, mother become infected with dog bite by work on the farms. And then my grandmother passed away. So my, my father become a orphan at the age of five. So his uncle adopted him to say, hey, if you want to just have food to eat, you gotta work on the farm. I don't have money for you to go to school. So my father never went to one day school. But he just, my father is one of my heroes. He has this human dignity and pride. He will not let anybody bully him, even though he's an orphan, he does not have education. And he will get into fight, physically fight. 
and you can, you know, see on my Facebook, uh, my uh, website, his pictures, you know, if you have never been to Sichuan, Sichuan, it is like a wild west of China. We have a famous saying, Sichuan people, they're not very tall, they're kind of short, we want lack of sunshine there, but Sichuan people are the first one to rebel, last one to submit. That's our reputation. <laughs> Typical Sichuan guy, you know. Have you heard of the people saying sky is very high, emperors are far away? So Sichuan people actually have lots of local mafias, all local groups, and the different villages on different uh, hills. My my grandmother is another hair of mine. Remember the lotus feet in China as a woman, if you were five six year old, if you want to marry up, marry well. You need to bind your feet. That means to crush your little uh, bones inside your feet. They will not grow because Chinese uh, men are very sick. They love little Chinese women's feet. The smaller, the better, the more sexy. My grandma said, uh, Father, I'm not going to do that. It's a very painful process. I would rather be dead if you made me to do that. And uh, her father was a liquor man. He said, you know, said, well, I'm sorry if you do this, you're going to marry peasants. Uh, okay, I will not make you. So, I mean, he wasn't that ideological because he was a liquor businessman. And so my grandmother, from her generation, one of the very few women, has a big feet. And, uh, but he did not, she did not marry peasants. She actually married one of the outlaw leaders in Sichuan Mountains. And uh, my real grandfather, or you know, great-grandfather, had two wives. My grandma is the second wife. So she had to swallow that in. I have big feet, but I want I like powerful, you know, rich men, so I'm gonna become second wife. <laughs> and <laughs> that did not last very long. Did not last very long. After two years, you know, uh, my real grandfather got killed. My grandma had two kids, my mother and my uncle, they had to flee the village to go to cities to get a job and also to protect her babies. And she always tell me, thank God for my big feet. Otherwise, I'd be stuck in the village. When you have a little lotus feet, you, you walk like this, literally. You, you know, because you don't work on the farm. You marry a rich guy, you stay home, have babies, have parties, you know. And uh, so when I was uh, little, because my grand, uh, my, my um, dad, family died, and he become classified as red. If my grandfather was living that time, Landlord, landowner, we will be black class. You know, we, you know that Mao divided people into ten classes: five red, five black. Thank goodness, my dad was red. Become red after become orphan. So I was a red child. <laughs> if you watch the cultural revolution movies, you see all those uh, red girls and young pioneers and hold the Chairman Mao's books. Long live Chairman Mao! Long live Communist Party! March, march, doing dances, I would be one of them. Can you imagine that? Well, you have no choice. That's the only thing you got from government schools. I was seven years old, become first, first grader in Chinese schools. I learned my first lesson about collective society. I, I was a little bit natural, different from my peers. I was uh, so-called too confident. That's my criticism. So when I was seven years old, I made 100% of all my subjects. So I told my girlfriend, don't you think I'll be the first one to be nominated to join Young Pioneer because I'm so good? She report to my teacher. And uh, my teacher called me in, the class, in, in her office, oh, I heard you're bragging about yourself, <laughs> and you'll be the first one to join Young Pioneer. I'm not going to let you wear that red scarf yet because you are too confident. You are not humble. She told me, I saw that this will never get out. I said, yes, teacher. And she said, I'm going to hold you back. You need to be like everybody else. And uh, they, then she concluded, in our collective society, self-confidence, individual expression are not allowed. You need to be like everybody else or the other kid. I complained to my parents. My parents are also brainwashed. So we agree with you, teacher. You, you need to be humble, okay? Just, 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 
just tone down the hype cell, true color. I learned that. I never forget that lesson. After that, I feel like, oh, I cannot trust anybody. I cannot trust my, my best girlfriend. They will, they will report on me. So since that age, I have learned how to move up because I do want to become successful. I was always ambitious. I, 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 I want to be admired. So I had to hide my true colors. I quickly learned in our system that time, the only cultural revolution, when teacher asks you to write diaries, you have to write bullshit. <laughs> That's not a turnover for them to review it. When they say you gotta confess, you really confess. You, 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 oh, say, dear to my mom, I thought about something today, it's not correct. I'm sorry. Here's what my neighbor said. That's what we're encouraged you to do. You report on your family members, on your neighbors who are not politically correct, potential country revolutionaries, bonjourazi capitalists, and as a red child, I need also constant self criticism. So if I have something to confess to tear my mouth, you know, you just write in your diaries. That way, teacher will think, "Oh, you are on the same page. You are a good student." But deep in my heart, I know it's like a, I'm like a double-faced. I'm, I'm, I'm keep something to myself. Don't write down anything private in your diary. As a little girl, I wanted to look pretty. I wanted to be attractive. But under Mao, if you are female, you want to look pretty? Oh, not political correct. <coughs> Dress like this is banned. Colorful clothes not really fit into the collective society. If you do fingernail polishes, you even have a hair laid down like this, it's like something wrong with you. You are, you are not like other people. We all have to do short hair like guys, unisex hairstyle, very ugly. I had long hair, but I had to do pinky tails or two long braids. You have to braid your hair. Pass your shoulder like this, it's bad. You cannot wear red scarf if you do hairstyle like this. Our colors, white, gray, blue, like typical, you see in China, that time, just lack of color. Lack of color, everybody is wearing the same color. And you go out and then you, then you, you wear your red scarf and white shirt. And I had a little bands like this because I did not want to look like a, like a for example, just your whole forehead like this, right? I had little bands. I remember I was criticized. You know, don't you think a bands is a little bit uh, capitalist style? Mm -hmm. Everything they don't like, they call that capitalist lifestyle. That's why you know sometimes people say, "Hey, why, why, why always you want to look pretty and wear dresses?" Because I can now. I can wear whatever I want in this free country. Nobody's gonna tell me what Halloween outfit I cannot dress up in. You know, I'm no longer political correct. And the date. So you were saying it's human nature. Oh, boys attract to girls. No. Under Mao, human nature is twisted, oppressed. I was class president. One boy wrote a love letter to a girl in middle school, like eighth grade. And the girl freaking out, come to talk to me. What should I do? What should I do with this love letter? Of course, I was political correct. I was class president. Of course you know what to do. Turn over to the teacher. This kind of behavior is not allowed. It's banned dating. So I did it. I turned over to the teacher. I never saw that boy smiling again. You know, I, I feel somehow guilty at that time. And uh, of course, uh, years later, especially in this country, I wish I could find where that boy is. Apologize to him. Sorry, you know, like we all brainwashed to be a state government agent. <laughs> And uh, we did all those things and, and did not realize, you know, how inhuman, how bad it was because we were used and we were brainwashed. And uh, so I moved up, I wear a red scarf, I become red guard. I, I was best student. I remember Chair My Mouse quotations, the Karl Marx quotations, even though I did not know what they really mean, you know. And uh, I even bought a Chair My Mouth book from Amazon, they translate to now English. You can get a little Chair My Mouth quotation book, bilingual. When I look back, I was in government schools from 7 to 12. 
five years. Just imagine you, you do this kind of stuff for five years. I could have never wake up, just be communist forever. Like Lenin said, give me a child for four years, he would be bourgeois forever. But when Mao died, we were so sad. Mao become like our god. I was raised as Buddhist, but our temples were shut down, Christians persecuted. Here's something about communism. They want to be your only religion. You have no other choices. Mao wants to be your only god. We see this famous song, Mom, Dad, a deer, but the more deer is Chiang Mai Mao. You see that every day. <laughs> so it's like Chiang Mai Mao is competing to be your parents. You cannot see love. When you see love, only in collective sense. I love my country, I love my party, and I love Chiang Mai Mao. It's hard to even express and publicly, oh, I love my parents. Well, Chiang Mai Mao is more dear. Why do you love your parents so much? They always destroy fabrics of society, which is a family. And they want you to be loyal only to the regime. Everybody is super statist. You don't trust your neighbors. You don't trust anything else. I never heard of concept private property. After my parents come years later in this country, they always talk about state enterprises. I say, mom, dad, this is America now. You do not think everybody, you know, government owns everything. Well, it looks like we're going down that path. And uh, so that uh, my, uh, and the privacy, it's also some concept I never heard of. Here, here's our privacy. Your door's wide open, anybody can walk in. We have a black communist committee chairman in every neighborhood. That's how communists control masses. It's from the grassroots neighborhood level to all the way to Beijing the top. So many different layers of control. And your teachers, administrators, they can walk into your house. You sit on your bed, because we, here's how we live. My dad got an apartment from his factory. Eight families share one bathroom. Eight families. It's a big ground on the floor, divided in the middle, one for male, one for females. It's really scary to go to that bathroom at night because there's no light bulbs. When light bulb goes bust, nobody's care to fix it. Hey, it's community housing. Well, we don't own that bathroom, so so I have my own little flashlight. I Me, mean, other people do. I do not because they, you know, you have the money to go buy a little flashlight so you can go there in the dark. I so I was so scared to go to that bathroom and little girl. And that a family share one water faucet. So you lined up to cook dinner. There's long line there. Everybody has pots and pans. My dad is smart. Let's build a container, water reserve place. So as the oldest child, I have two little brothers. I will be the one carry a big pot. Always go to there when nobody's there, dump water into container. I got little strong muscles. By the time I went to college at the age of 17, all those Shanghai girls were shocked. I get on the floor to 50 push-ups, just like that. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> like, wow, you're really good. <laughs> I said, well, because I carry big water containers <laughs> all the time. And uh, um, so by the time that uh, you know, we get older, we're always starving, guess what? You have food coupons from government. Here, you're working class at the bottom, so you get uh, two pounds of pork a month for family of five. You get a coupon to buy rice, wheat flour. So when we really out of money, nothing to eat, send me to my parents to go to field. <coughs> get some whatever grain, wheat, some stuff. You can come home boil. We don't even have baking fat. No pork lard to cook stuff with. Those are luxuries. Milk powder is luxury. So you go bring the stuff and boil it, put the Sichuan. Sichuan people love spicy food, right? So you put the Sichuan paper sauce on your vegetable, that on rice, that's how you swallow your plain rice. But still, we were told we need to be grateful. Look, you have rice to eat. Two thirds of the world population were starving to death. At least you should be grateful you have rice to eat. I just feel like every two hours I was starving, my stomach was growling. My uncle told me, how to trap some rats in the neighborhood. Have you ever tried rat meat? No. <laughs> you cannot <laughs> imagine that, but when your stomach is groaning, you know, it's just suck on little, little bones, it's uh, delicious. <laughs> but pretty soon you ran out of rats too, because everybody trying to catch them. And uh, 
talk about environment, right? Some people say, oh, China is good on environment. You know, what environment? We don't even say birds, and we, 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 we have no pets. We had one dog in our neighborhood. In a family, there's one dog owned by one couple. Then police come in, say, the, no, you are violating the law. You cannot have pets. That was only joy in our childhood life. I never had any toys and no radios, nothing, you know. That was only joy that we had a little dog. Then they had to kill it, they had to put down, and I ate it. Because, you know, you were starving, you're not gonna waste that dog meat. Oh, I, I refused to try, they, they, they gave everybody, you know, some little bit. And uh, I remember that very clearly. So that's how we grew up. So by the time Mao died, I was so sad because I really, I, you know, I was really becoming a little communist. You know, I can hear Mao talking to me from the crowd, <laughs> like the cartoon we watch, Simba, right? Talking to his father, Simba, you know, and the Mao is talking to me. Then when you burn fire to cook, I turn my mouth face shut up, smiling, you know. That, that's how bad that become, you know, when the statism, communist become your religion, you know, it's like a, he become your God, and how could he die? I was 12 years old. I was so sad, you know, you're supposed to mourn for his death for one month. And uh, so 12, when I was 14 years old, about that time, 13, 14, the party came out to say, okay, Chairman Mao, as a human being, he made a mistake. Cultural revolution was a mistake. So like my generation, my uncle generation, my parents' generation were all just uh, totally lost. We don't know how to digest information. It's like, a, wow, we were lost souls. It was a mistake. What do we believe now? We have no religion. We have no other ideology. We have no concept of many, many things like called freedom, individual rights, nothing. We only believe the mouth, and he died. But thank goodness the university restated. So now we have a new goal, is to go to Chinese university. During the Cultural Revolution, Mao Xiaodang, all schools. Remember the red guards who were sent to the mountains, re-educated by peasants? Mao used red guards, my uncle generation, like they're in the 60s today, to, to tell them, go after revolutionary, counter-revolutionaries, revisionists, capitalists, your professors, dissidents. Ray guards were cheering for him. You know, the, the schools were shutting down, so they have full-time job now to go after those people. By the time Mao used them up, purging his political enemies, and he realized those kids have become very violent. They were like bodies coming down to the rivers. So Mao said, well, time to go to the country where right? we educated by peasants, down the mountains, called the Down the Mountains campaign. My uncle was 17. He was excited, I'm going to work for government, get paid salary, and I'm going to go to Yunnan <laughs> province from Sichuan, which is like two days bus ride back there, to the Burma border. He went there with my two other uncles from other parts of China. Ten years use, wasted. No education, hard labor, political brainwash. When they realized, my God, we are used. We want to come back to our city and I'll come talk back to our parents. But they were silenced by the state. When I go to college campuses, I always use red guards as an example to say, you remind me of red guards if you want to silence other people's free speech. You will be silenced later yourself. So I just remember when I was in college, you saw posters on the wall says, we want to come home. If you don't let us, we're going to kill ourselves. So they put their blood fingerprints on the posters on the wall. They are planning massive, mass suicide, lying their bodies on the railway tracks, let the train run them over. That got the each state government attention to say, we cannot let this happen. We, we, need a, we need to have a way to get them back. If you are married to little girls, you cannot come back home. Your resident status change. So if you are single, your parents have jobs for you in the cities, they can come back. My uncle was 17 to 27. He said he was tempted to love, to marry the local pretty girls. He was young. He said, I couldn't, because otherwise I'd be stuck there forever in the poor countryside, remote area. 
He's very anti-government today. I constantly worry about him. He will go to Chinese WeChat, Facebook to see something anti-government. I say, Uncle, you want to come out to visit me? If you keep doing that, they will let you. They will not let you get on their plane. They say, Okay, I won't come there. <laughs> he said, I, I suffering enough. I'm not going to sign this now. So he constantly says something like that. When I go home, I'm like a national traitor. Everybody wants to talk to me privately. Tell us what's going on. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? I know I cannot talk about politics on Chinese Facebook because I will become target. I still want to go home, visit my family and friends. And, and, and you know how Chinese government keep track of everybody, right? You have a household registration system. So when you get married, you go register with the police station. And they know where you live, who do you work for, they give you a little booklet. When you add a child with permission to have a child from your work unit, then you register that child. So without this booklet, this household registration, you basically become illegal. It's like almost national ID. Then each individual has individual student file and the personnel file that follow you from birth to death. So if one person becomes anti-government, your entire family is at a risk. You know, there's a girl went to New York in Maryland. She spoke at the commencement last May. Talk about free speech. It's like fresh air that the China is lacking. And everybody come in, criticize her. Her families were threatened in Shanghai to say, tell your daughter, shut up. Oh, river, cultural revolution, what happened to your family? Guess what? She disappeared. I don't know where she went. She should apply for political asylum. She disappeared. She took down all her Twitter. She apologized. I'm sorry. You know, I do love my country. It's like she did not say anything about love loving her country. I said that she truly loved her country. That's why she's saying that. But people will jump out, organized by consulate office, to criticize her. So when I when I finally realized I was lied to, and I don't have face anymore, I just focus on school. I just wanted to go to college. In college, four years, I went to study law. Four years law school is like a bachelor degree. In China, you know how you can go to state colleges? You take a three whole days nationalized college exam. Think about you take ACT for three whole days, eight hours a day. After that, you feel like you're dead. Got to go sleep for one week, <laughs> catch up your sleep. And they want you to choose your university before you even have a test result. Because that's the system set up. So I wanted to study law. I said, I'm going to change China. My teacher told me, a very handsome math teacher, tall, he told me when I was 16. He was sick. I visited him as class president. He said uh, he was a fresh college graduate in the 50s. The Communist Party said, Come on, kids, give us true feedback. How we are doing to build new China? And they were so naive. They gave feedback. Just like, you know, just like Harry Wu said that he criticized even Russia invading Hungary. It had nothing even to do with China. Then they all get on blacklist. You go to concentration camp, labor camp. So his health was ruined. He was very bitter. And he told me that really hit me. He said, Lily, our country is ruled by men not ruled by law. And I said, oh, I'm going to study no then. I was ambitious. I'm going to change China. I'm going to transform China from society ruled by men to society rule of law. So I, 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 I choose all law majors. And I got in, my top choice. I studied for, high, for the interest exam for college for two years in high school, no fun. Every day, just to study to test, study to test. You become like a robot, basically. But I did well. I got good memory. So I got accepted. In law school, first week, the professor who taught theory of law discussed with us, what do you think? The purpose of law. So we were like, we're saying, well, you know, it's to protect people. It's to offer justice and protection to people's rights and properties. Like whatever they say in the Constitution, but it's just paper. No, no, professor said, the purpose of law is to use by the governing class to govern the masses. Like, really? 
That's the Soviet Union model. That's the lost purpose. We become so disappointed. It's like a dream just got crushed a little bit at the beginning. Well, that's the purpose. Then what, what am I here for? You know? So I become very disfranchised and rebellious college student. Hey, you lost your face, you lost communism, you don't believe that crap anymore. I mean, like you gotta look for something else, right? Kind of search for truth. We started what? Dancing parties. We were not allowed to go to school at the beginning with the hair done, wear Western blue jeans, it's called a capitalist lifestyle, dressing, and we cannot even go to school campus. We were like live outside the campus in the dormitory buildings. But we always fight with them, fight with guards. So finally, educational department say, okay, you can, you can go now, you can, have, you can wear this because they just gave up. And they, they banned our dancing parties, but they could not ban our spirit. We were dancing in the student hallways in the dormitory. When you are a college student in China at that time, it's like a military camp. 10 o'clock, lights off. But you hear people playing boombox. Dun, 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 dun. We're dancing in the hall, we practice uh, dancing steps. Remember disco, I mean, it was popular in this country in the 60s. We loved it in the 80s. He came to China in the 80s. <laughs> and uh, I loved the disco. Oh. I have never listened to music like that exciting. You don't need a partner, you can dance any way you want, twist your body, you know, shake your booty any way you want. <laughs> was well, such such a liberation. And one thing really changed my life in college. We had an Asian soccer game won by Chinese men's team. We got together. Hey, whenever you need an excuse to get together for college students to start bonfire, we will. So we start bonfire, we're dancing, we're chanting, yes, victory! And that chanting event becomes something different. We're saying freedom, democracy, reforms. I guess that uh, we were oppressed for so long. I, he always say, yes man, yes sir, yes teacher, right? You put your hands behind you, that's how we grow up until high school graduation. And you go to college, it's like, a, oh now we can yell, scream out in this open field. I never heard my voice that loud and that strong, you know? And uh, we have curfew, 10 o'clock you must back to your dormitory room. All people can call on, on campus cops on you. I didn't go home, go back to my room that night until 2 a.m. because we started to walk in the neighborhood. Besides the campus, we went out hands by hands. We're walking the neighborhood to say, you know, political reform, human rights, and freedom. We were so excited. I came home like a face were red and very excited still. My roommate, who was very brainwashed, she said, where do you go? I said, oh, I protested. Today's big day in my life. You know, we were yelling for freedom. She looked at me. You're kind of crazy. Don't do this again. I'm going to call cops next time. And uh, I guess she is the vice president of law school today. She moved up <laughs> in China. And I, 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 after, my, after my four years of law school, I, uh, you know, when you graduate in China at that time, there's no job market. Everybody get a signed job by educational department. So I wanted so bad to stay in Shanghai. I did not want to go back to Chengdu. Chengdu is more isolated. It's like three days train ride that time from Shanghai to Chengdu. Shanghai is more liberated, more Western. And plus we had more foreign students and teachers. I met one American student when I was junior in law school at dancing party. And he, he's a, I don't know where he is, he's from East. He said, Lily, you want to see something I brought from the United States? I said, sure. When you go to see a foreign student in college, you must register your name, your major, your dormitory address, who I'm going to see, what I'm going to talk about. Time in, time out. I did all that first time. Guess what he showed me? He showed me a pocket constitution. And he read to me, my English wasn't good that time. He read to me the, the first paragraph, all men are created equal and you have this natural rights given to you by your creator. I, I said, what do you mean natural individual rights? And he explained to me, he said, not given to you by anybody, by, by, by your government. It's you are born with it as a human being with those rights. And uh, my light bulb came on. Then he talked about those rights. I said, come back next time, let's talk more. So next time when I go back, 
I refuse to register. Something just make me don't want to do it. So when the old lady goes to bathroom or goes to pour her hot cup of tea, I will tiptoe upstairs very quick. I run upstairs and I talk to him. And I slick down again. We did that a few times. <laughs> he showed me the map of the United States. He put something in my head. If someday I have to leave China for another country, I will come to America. This is free country. Wow, you can vote for your representatives. You actually can have guns. I mean, those all sounds like, oh, I don't want to go to Europe. They still have kings and queens. I don't like that system. <laughs> like we had an emperor for thousands of years. So, I, so that day did come. I graduated. I got teaching job at law school faculty. Out of 60 students, they have five spots because we're first graduation class. Five spots to be faculty members stay in Shanghai at the university. I got one of the spots with my supervisor, my advisor's help. I have a, people always have a love-hate relationship with me. I have a company boss, hated me, don't want me to stay. I have another advisor, really liked me, want me to stay. So my side won, so I finally stayed in Shanghai. But uh, to teach in law school, you have to join Communist Party. They want to make sure your loyalty is correct. So, okay, we have to apply to join. And then they put you on probation for one year to see how you're doing, how you're political correct. But uh, that time, I could not still be like in the past, cheer for them. After I went through four years of Benny's college life, I'm just not an old, you know, red guard, old young pioneer anymore. I will go to political meetings, don't say anything. They can tell me I'm silent, talk, you know, like making eye contact with them, disapprove what they're saying. And uh, so my Communist Party boss gave me a hard time. All university today in China, you have two lines supervising. You have academic supervision from your dean, your supervisor, department chair, and you have Communist Party supervision for political um, PC. But the political PC controls everything. They are the number one above all others. So this boss and I don't get along. He knows I'm silently challenging him and uh, constantly pick on me and constantly talk to me. Not just my academic life, like how to teach students, review my notes, and he also tell me, don't go to dancing party anymore. You are a faculty member now. You are no longer law school students. My students are one year younger than me. They're like my friends. I said, I'm doing that out of my personal time, not affecting my job. Why do you want to tell me what to do with my free time? And he said, well, because it's not politically correct. It's wrong lifestyle for you. He's going to decide my lifestyle. And I, I hated that guy, but I have, to, I have to bite my tongue. So after one year teaching law school, I was wondering, do I have a future in China? Am I going to live here free? Am I really going to change China's legal system to rule of law? I, I become so depressed. I say, probably hell no. They're going to change me. I need to get out. That's when I realized I need to get out. I mean, I even cut hair, look professional. I try to make him happy, but he still constantly bother me and tell me about my personal life. I had a boyfriend in Shanghai, and his family invited me to go over, have sleepover, eat a hot homemade meal. And my boss found that out, say, why are you going to their house? You're not married yet. I said, are you assuming I'm going to do something you do not approve? His parents invite me, I'm going to share bed with their daughter. And he tell me, you should not go. And you're trying to become a Communist Party member. You don't need to mind your lifestyle. Oh my God, it's like a, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't continue that way. Say myself, okay, I'm, I'm climbing career ladder. I become assistant professor, professor, and then what? My life is over. I need to get out. Here's a country called America. You know, that my friends, some, when China opened up economically, and my, some of my friends left for U.S. universities. They all sent me pictures. Beautiful country. He sent me pictures of cattle. It's a ranch country, actually. Oh, he looks so happy. He said, you should come to America. Your personality will fit here better. I guess I was kind of just natural born libertarian, but I did not know it. <laughs> I want to be free. But I did not know what I was fighting 
for just like leave me alone, leave me alone. It's like, but here's the problem: if you want to leave China, you need to get permission from your party boss. He has to say we let her quit and she's going to the United States to study. So I have to change my strategy. I'm not dummy. I do whatever I can to leave. I start to become talkative again, a political study meeting. I start to say, Kumbaya, yes, body's right, let's do this. You know, it's like acting, right? You're not truly speaking the truth out of your heart, but you're acting. So finally, I got an American sponsor and to be my um, US uh, like a citizen sponsor. I met at a dancing party and they go to my boss so that I got accepted by University of Texas for master's degree, can I leave? And he said, well, will you promise come back after you get a master's degree? <laughs> uh, of course. And uh, when he didn't sign agreement, after bottling him up and showed my performance well, he gave me a piece of paper. Promise after two years, three years college, a master's degree, go back to Shanghai, all two consequences. Kick you out of the party, okay? <laughs> <laughs> like, who cares, right? I was uh, made to join anyway. Uh, I don't buy their, their stuff anymore. And, uh, but second one is serious, has serious consequences. They're gonna kick my personnel file back to Chengdu. I just told you earlier about personnel file, if you, Live in Shanghai, want to be legal resident, you need to have your file with you. Because my household registration is in China, Chengdu. My personnel file in Shanghai becomes my new job. If they kick my personnel file back to Chengdu, I can never go back to Shanghai legally to get a job, to work, to live. Maybe a tourist. I had, I had to buy that time to say yes. Because if I don't say that, I cannot leave. And, uh, in my heart, I just say, I got to make it in this country. I, I, I have to start a new life here. So it's my last attempt. Then I went to apply for passport seven times. They stay always, the police station threw papers at my face. Why do you want to go to America? They're an imperialist country. You don't you love your motherland anymore? Oh, gave me all that political lecture. You have to bite your tongue to say, oh, I just want to serve my country better. It's all that piece. You have to always say those things that are government rhetoric, even though you don't mean it. Oh, I will come back soon, my country better, sir. You know, please consider my, you know, passport request. They want to apply for visa three times. After all that hassle, two years struggle, I finally got my visa come to the United States. So next month, May 11th, I'll be in this country for 30 years. <laughs> To be honest with you, I did not have money. I had $100 in my pocket. I borrowed it from my friends. Hey, I'm gonna get rich. Give me money, 10 bucks here, 10 bucks here, write down their list. It was $1 equal Chinese 8 yuan at that time. That's a lot of money. And the faculty member, assistant professor, you don't make much. I sent my money back home to help my parents. And, uh, and I owe my professor 1,200 US dollars for TOEFL exam, admission, you know, cost air ticket. And I had to live with him to promise cook and clean in order to get a free room for three months. But my, but my dream was big. I'm free, I'm finally free, I can do whatever I want. I will survive, I will make it. Even though I did not know how, I did not know how to pay bills. But first night, it's like destination to be. If I believe God, maybe this is uh, God's will. Even though I'm Buddhist, Maybe it's Buddha's will. I, I, I come to Austin, Texas. I met my husband first night. He was about 29 years old and uh, just waiting around for a bride, I guess, to show up. <laughs> <laughs> he told me he gave up already. He's a learner. He's a physics master degree guy. And all girls in his department, including Chinese girls, are nerds. And he was shy. He never officially dated, and he already gave up. I just go be simple, simple, single for a while. And here, my his mother said, "We have Chinese students come over. She's from Mongolia, riding horses." <laughs> so he made me really big and tall, tough woman, you know, from Mongolia, right? More than Chinese compared with Sichuan Chinese. Chinese Sichuan are very small. 
And I showed up with a little thing. I was only 98 pounds and uh, very sick. I threw up on an airplane trip. Like, it's like first time I took that long flight. I wasn't used to it. I was throwing up. I showed up very pale. And uh, my sponsor told them I really loved watermelon in China. So they gave me watermelon and ice cream. I was stomach sick. It's like, oh, it's hard to eat those, but I had to be polite, eat all that. They had diarrhea for one week. <laughs> <laughs> they call it change of water. When you go to one country, new country, the soil is different, water is different, so you need to just wash your stomach, all stuff out, get a new system in, and you'll be okay. Oh, I was miserable. Every day I would think about oh, Chinese hot soup, please, but I was living with an American professor. I woke up, I don't even want to say. It. My English wasn't good. I had to say what to say. <laughs> Good morning, it's like very simple stuff. I carry my little pocket notebook and, uh, and every time when people talk to me, I'm sorry, I don't then write down. I have to learn how to spell Vediger, like household stuff, just Vediger and this or that. And they write down stuff for me, I go home, look at uh, my Chinese dictionary and uh, just carry that book. Every day you look at it, you practice using it, pretty soon you will get used to it. For the first year, it was a struggle. You could not understand what professors were saying. I also did not know what the school social work is about. I, I went there because uh, my sponsor, next door neighbor, neighbor because my mother, you know, she was dean of the school social work. She has authority to waive my GRE test. So I come here through kind of a backdoor connection, waive the GRE because my English was so poor, I could never pass GRE. So we did whatever we could, just get me in the door. So I went to school social work. I was the only Chinese student there. I could not have anybody help me what they're talking about. I had a hard time to understand what the hell is the community. Because I look at dictionary, it tells me something totally different. They always talk about community, community. So what is community? So over the years, of course, I got it. So I went through the graduate school, and uh, I did not realize, you know, those people are very nice people, compassionate, but they are liberals. They all want to use government to help special minority groups, and, which I understand because they're compassionate, they're nice people. But the one time I remember my English was good enough to join the class debate, I started to challenge them to say, well, have you thought about this big picture of society? Is that good or bad if you keep doing this, right? I mean, you know, folks on small minority groups. And uh, they said, Lily, are you Republican or something? <laughs> I did not know that time, you know. I said, well, I'm an international student. I don't, I don't belong to any parties yet. So they started to challenge me, think I'm like uh, being brainwashed by somebody else. No, it's just that uh, they're compassionate, but they always like to use government, you know. And at that time, I just thought, hey, you know, we want to get away from that. So John and I got married. I took him to China, and we have three children. And uh, um, it's funny, I was fighting for freedom. I did not have an ideology. I did not know in China what I was fighting for. And come to this country, if you give me a test, I will be statist. I never learned about free market. I always, always turn to government for solutions. For 20 years in this country, with my libertarian husband's help, I always give him the credit. He's happy about that. And, and I become only libertarian in 2008. After 20 years of fighting against my own indoctrination, you have to change your entire attitude, opinion, mentality, and the philosophy. He told me, read some other books, because uh, when he criticized China, said so you were lied to, I did not believe him at the beginning, because I was homesick, I was patriotic. I miss my family and love my country, even though I did not like my communist boss. And, uh, he said, you were lied to. You need to read some different books. My English started to get better. And uh, so, so I started to read some, especially I got laid off year of 2000. I had more time to read and to watch news and to start to learn about American grassroots democracy. Guess what? I had a time in my hands. I said, where do I start to learn about self-governance in the United States? People suggest to me, go run for HOA board. I did. <laughs> I become my HOA board member. They're trying to raise my dues. I did not like that. So I had to <laughs> And I went there. So from there, I went to internship in the state house. And the first day I come home depressed. John said, what happened? You're not happy to work there? 
I said, John, the state capitals like a zoo. <laughs> <laughs> there are so many special interests that ask for money. Nobody represents us. We pay taxes. But there's nobody representing us. And uh, it was a good learning experience. And when my kids started to become school age, I said, well, I heard there's a charter school. And they had an open meeting. I went there. I signed my kids up. It's like, oh, sounds good. Parents are going to be in charge. And parents are going to hire principal and fire principal. And so I got my kids into charter school. And uh, because we had a bad experience with public school, my five-year-old was talking about blow up universities. Uh, like his dad, an engineering guy, right? Like to build bombs and blow up things. And that was after uh, September 11th. He got a referral to principal. A oh, poor little kid. So they was just playing a fantasy game. And I thought that's like a little bit of lack of common sense. Only five-year-old boy. So I took my kids out of the public school, put in charter school. And later I run for the board. I become governing council chairwoman. And I had to practice speech, speaking. And, uh, and I fired principal under my watch. That was very empowering. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, you are fire me, Lily? I said, I'm sorry, we decided not to offer you another year's contract. <laughs> <laughs> I learned how to diplomatic speak good English. <laughs> I feel so in part of, wow, in China, you can never have an opportunity like that. So 2008, I was a Republican for many years because Jiang told me about the Libertarian Party, but I said, you're so small, you can never win. Right, sounds familiar. So, but when I got so pissed, 2008, because Bush built the banks, and we got to what? We, 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 got to, we got to, in order to save capitalism, and we got to not to do or capitalism first, right? Or something like that. Now, of course, the educational, national control, no child left behind, all that stuff. And I was kicking boxing in front of the TV, got so mad. And my husband said, well, I told you, there's a Libertarian Party. <laughs> so I, I checked the Libertarian Party out. I started to go, go to their events. And uh, um, I told my husband, well, you're a Libertarian all your life. He told me he's a Libertarian since 13. He's a lifetime Libertarian member. I said, how come you don't do anything? They said, well, a lot of Libertarian like that. They just uh, they believe it, but they don't do anything. I said, well, now it's me. Let's go out. Put, put the money where our mouth is. And I truly, truly believe the philosophy of libertarianism. You know, from a former communist, like a little good, perfect little slave for the state, to believe you have natural rights as one human being. And nobody can take that away from you. So it's a big, long journey and learning curve. But I'm a big believer today now. So no matter what I do in the future, you can believe I'm a libertarian heart. I'm going to defend personal liberty and freedom. And that's my cause for the rest of my life. And that's why I decided to also join you guys in New Hampshire. Let's keep this day. <laughs> Until we can come. So 
liberty form, freedom, I mean like a pork fest or whatever you activity you have. I will be you'll be seeing me a lot, don't get tired of me. <laughs> question. I apologize this time. That's all right. You're welcome. Um, my question is, I understand that recently the government of China has instituted a new program. It's similar in a way to our uh, credit rating system that individuals have. Social but credit. It, yeah, social credit. credit. Would you speak to that just for a bit, please? So for more people it's kind of interesting. The, the Chinese government actually is very technology savvy and uh, sneaky. They know everybody is on social media. You have to use cell phone now to do personal banking, everything's there. And uh, so they figure out a way to keep track of you because they want to people still no dissident. Uh, they want you to be loyal. So they created a system. They said to, at the beginning, sounds good. It's like, oh, if you have bad behaviors, that want them to not give you a good score, so you cannot take a, like a loan, buy a house, you cannot get job promotion. But now the social system, credit system is a lot broader. It could include your groups on social media that you are part of. If your friends are saying something anti-government, they can drag you social um, credit score down. So make you want to dissociate with those friends. So you watch, basically, you turn into bigger, kind of like a spying community. Now, if you say something, you're going to affect me, I'm going to tell you, oh, shut up, don't say that, because you're going to affect my score. So that's how bad it is. But I talked to my friend who was teaching Colorado College as a professor, visiting professor. He said, uh, China is big. You got a 1.4 billion Chinese. They can do this experiment right now on the spot, different places, but they cannot really keep track all. He's still paying $8 a month for APN, so he can cross the fireball and to watch YouTube. He, he watched all my YouTube videos. <laughs> you know, he said, lots of people like us, professors who work for Social Science Institute of Shanghai government, who are still doing this. So it will take a long time to roll it out. But uh, don't ever underestimate, you know, they, they, they are um, in power. And I think uh, sh uh, the new president especially, and um, I think uh, his uh, ideology is uh, kind of close to Chairman Mao's. He wants to be the one. So he, that's why he, got, he changed the Chinese constitution and he made himself a lifetime president if he wants to and scare lots of Chinese students in this country. They don't, don't want to go back home. <laughs> they have to figure out how to stay in this country. But they cannot use that excuse as a political solemn. So they have to find a job and all that. If, right now, there's like a very strong tension in China. Uh, you might not know this unless you saw me post on my Facebook. They banned this Chinese uh, app, entertainment app, where you access videos like Vine, very funny, sometimes they talk about sex stuff, and, and uh, not political at all. And they banned this app with 200 million Chinese young people users. Is that still bad? You turn those groups very political now. They go out, they protest it, and they sing this song to show their frustration about their life in China. And now this song is banned. A regime can, buy, can just ban so much stuff. So now they, you, they use a car. Everybody is kind of wealthy now in the cities. They have cars. They use a car signal, D, 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 when you honk like that in uniform, D, D, D. D. So you can be driving on the highway. All of a sudden, you hear one person say, D, 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 is like they're calling for their comrades. And they're the same users who want to protest. Pretty soon, the whole highway is dee, dee, dee. It's all this big <laughs> noise. And, and cops don't know which car. They cannot go after the car. Who is doing dee, dee, dee? You, mean you, you watch on YouTube video, it's an amazing sight. So they turned this group of kids, born after 1990s, into political group. Because they said, uh, we lost purpose of life. We just want to be entertained. Now you take our rights away to be entertained. Where you, Congress Carter, sleep with a woman, have a bastard kids, and you tell us we are no moral people because we want to listen to about sexuality jokes online, it's like you are hypocrites. So this group can combine with the human rights group to do something. I don't know, on May, on May 1st, they're supposed to organize public protests. I think the Chinese government is already freaking out. They tell people, no vacations on May 1st. 
which is International Labor Day, it's supposed to be vacation day. <laughs> but, but they're afraid everybody's going to go out. So we'll see what happens. You know, but there's, it's, in my lifetime, I'm hoping I can see my first, uh, you know, you know, motherland to become more free. But I, I, I don't know. I'm like 50-50. I will do my part. That's why I'm low profile right now. Because once I become uh, more effective, my voice will be heard by so many people, I can make a bigger impact. Of course, my family will be at risk. But hey, sometimes you just have to um, overcome your fear. So I'm sure you have nothing to fear, right? You have one government watch you, I have two. <laughs> yeah, that's all right, you know. Everybody's gonna die someday. You might just live on your knees, you know. Any other questions? Yes? What was it about New Hampshire that was so attractive to you? Well, first of all, I came here and uh, because uh, I heard of Free State Project at Freedom Fest, and I, after I ran two times already in Colorado as Libertarian Kennedy, I was looking for options. I've been there for 19 years, and uh, um, more and more big government guys there. So I, I read, of course, Cato's, uh, and, you know, number one free state is New Hampshire. You have you're the only state without state income tax and sales tax and public combination with the constitutional carry, all that good stuff. So I come here. First time, show up at the Manchester airport, just me and my girlfriends. Like, this state is that small, only two of us here. <laughs> <laughs> but I love it. I said, is this great? We have an entire airport to ourselves. Of course, we arrived very late at midnight. And uh, the next time we leave, 7 o'clock in the morning, it's just very few people. Oh, I said, love it. Small airports and a small town, the biggest city is 110,000 people. And I used to be big city people, want to live on top of each other. The older I get, the more I start to enjoy the nature and space. It's nice, actually. You don't have your neighbor so close to you. And I'm a bad Chinese driver, too. I think I feel, <laughs> <laughs> I feel safer to drive here than Colorado. And I hate to drive to Colorado State Capitol. Oh, my big suburban can make some damages. And uh, um, so I come here. But the most important, after I met with a um, group of people, and I went to State Capitol. And I was shocked. There's no metal detector. And my realtor, of course, uh, Mark Warden, he was a con concealed carry. He said, Lily, we have no metal detectors. Said, Actually, I have something. I'm packing kids, but walk right in, no guards. I was like, wow. <laughs> that, that's shocking, pleasantly surprised. And I got a copy of the Constitution. I talked to people there. After I found out, you have 400 state reps, no pay, no per diem. And uh, you, as local resident, you can go to your town hall meetings, vote on everything, vote to include their budget, include union contract. It's like, a, I love this state political <laughs> system. I have more voice here as citizen, as individual citizen, plus we have all of us. We can really make a bigger impact. You know, really keep this state as a free state. After four mm -hmm. days, I was totally committed. <laughs> I had to figure out what is the best way to go home Bring this up to my husband. <laughs> <laughs> five months, five months argue, discuss, and persuading, you know. As libertarians, we cannot use force. <laughs> I cannot say, you can come or not, you know. If you don't come, I'm leaving anyway. I cannot say that. <laughs> so I have to convince him, come on, dear, let's do this. This will be more interesting for our life. Of course, not for money, because if, you know, he should uh, have longer career, and we have our investment properties, we have three children in Colorado, we have our families in Colorado and Wyoming. But I said, there we, you know, this will be our last chance, because we're not that young anymore. I wish I was in my 20s or 30s, and I have so many years ahead of me. No, I don't. I only have limited years. I want to make a big impact. I feel like after I went through all my sufferings, all my waking up process, I feel like this is something I was born to do. I was born to do something big in this country then also will affect people all over the world who love freedom. Because I have a unique, powerful story. And I can go testify, I can use my stories, maybe I can persuade some uh, people from all sides to join us, to say, hey, how precious personal freedom is. <clears throat> I do not have any. So maybe we can do lots of things, and uh, by using more freedoms to solve our problems, 
instead less freedom. Because people always turn to government, you know, they don't understand government is a force. And I always tell them that, especially the people on the left side, you know, <laughs> they don't understand that. He's like, they're pulling a gun at you. Can, you. can you choose not to pay taxes? You go to jail, you know? But if you do private charity, you feel great about yourself giving, they have to persuade you to earn your money, to give them money. So that's what I feel like, oh, New Hampshire system is great, and you state constitution, I love it. It's small, it's very small. But the people's motto, live free or die, I cannot wait to get that license plate. <laughs> <laughs> Anywhere? Anywhere. Chinese or English? <laughs> Both. Both. Yes. Oh. So What's she signing? Question. You'll see in a second. I think I will do my Chinese calligraphy, which is cool. <clears throat> How is that? Excellent. My Chinese name is Tang Ro. Tang is a family name, Ro's first name, so Chinese is backward. So when I first came here, Ro sounds like wrong don't like that, and uh, people cannot pronounce it correctly. But uh, my Chinese name, Rong, means water lily. Oh. So my sponsor said, why don't you use lily? That's a pretty name. Mm. I said, okay. And so that's how my <laughs> lily name is coming from. You know, it's, it's associated with my Chinese name, a city flower, I, you know, Chengdu, I, I grew up in, yeah. Any woman? I'd like to have some ladies' questions. <laughs> Any We've got time for one question yeah. from a lady. <laughs> I'm sorry, that sounds very discriminatory. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm yes. Are your children libertarian? Um, yes, actually. Uh, my children, I was tiger mom. I have to apologize. I wasn't so libertarian. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, so they, um, I was very strict because I always tell them, Mom was starving, don't waste food. If you don't finish me food, put it in the fridge, eat it next day, first thing. And uh, also, I expect them to achieve. In, 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 in schools, and uh, well, it's, it is true when Chinese mother not happy with your Bs, they want you to make all A's, if you can. But uh, we also just tell them, hey, you uh, try your best. And, uh, and they have to do chores, they have to work once they become 15 to, to, to learn how to manage their money. Don't just expect them to give to you go my toys. Actually, once you give them money to shop themselves, they're very picky. <laughs> and they go, they go to China with their money, and they learn how to negotiate in Chinese. 50% off. They say, half. Yiban, yiban, too expensive. Well, go away. <laughs> so you teach them how to manage money, how to do checkbooks. And, and uh, they complain a lot because uh, you know, they think we were too hard. I was too hard on them. And uh, I could have been a little bit more libertarian. So now I am better now. I'm listening to them better. But also, they're all young adults now. So much more pleasant to work with. You know? <laughs> 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 when, they were, when they were teenagers, it's like, oh, they, they talk bad, right? So my kids are very libertarian because we, we did send them to public school. I could not homeschool them, but I, we constantly deprogram them at dinner table. We have family dinner every night. We talk about school. We even teach them how to question their teachers and how to against bullying. Like one kid was bullied, we teach him to go, don't tell your teachers, but go rally all your friends into the bathroom, quarter him. <laughs> <laughs> Don't stop this. Work the big hell out of you. In the bathroom. In the bad mail. Actually, that guy, oh, okay, okay. He got scared because, uh, you know, oh, this guy can organize, get a big group together, scare him. He stopped bullying my kid. And my kid later become Air Force officer. <laughs> you know, he, he was little, like a more academic little boy and become somebody who really stand up for himself. You know, and uh, they are very libertarian. They always tell me, my, my daughter is, uh, I think my daughter is 18. And we're trying to get her to see our life, but she also very compassionate, and she wants to be a psychologist. So her her leaning sometimes can be to her left side, and that's okay. We allow kids to choose whatever they want to believe, but we just have discussion to see what approach is better to do what. And uh, so I'm very blessed in this country. I, I love this country, and I will not go anywhere else. Um, Unless, you know, something really goes crazy, you know, we can hide here in New Hampshire, <laughs> you know, or I don't know, labor land or whatever, but I'm not going to give up. We, we have to fight. We have to fight here. So thank you so much. Right? Thank you.
Thank you. We'd like to invite you to visit freekeen.com. Freekeen.com features audio, video, and blogs chronicling the transition to a voluntary society. Freekeen.com also has comments and discussion forums so you can be heard. Freekeen.com. I should be in Keene, New Hampshire with the Free Staters.